It's Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, has the sit-up been cancelled? Plus, the century-long history of growing non-native plants in Antarctica, and how it will help astronauts fill their bellies when they fly to the moon and beyond. And why mice are afraid of bananas. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. Do you remember being forced to do countless sit-ups in gym class as a kid? If you're of the right age, you may remember when sit-up requirements turned into crunches. And if you're young enough, maybe you saw the disillusion of those requirements altogether, replaced with something else, like perhaps holding a plank. Despite how many personal trainer influencers you might still see recommending crunches and sit-ups of all sorts online, there has been a quiet but marked turn away from sit-ups over the last decade. According to a recent piece in The Atlantic, every branch of the U.S. military has started to phase out sit-ups and crunches from their entrance tests and training regimens, or at least made them optional. The Presidential Youth Fitness Program, which in 2012 replaced the presidential fitness test that almost every American listening was subjected to as a child, now recommends curl-ups instead of sit-ups, a kind of subtle core exercise. So what's happening? Why have experts and long-running institutions started turning away from the humble sit-up? To get there, we first need to understand how the sit-up came to rule the fitness world in the first place. Amanda Mull, the author of the recent Atlantic piece, wrote, quote, The institutional push to get Americans to exercise started in the 19th century, when federal authorities feared that new kinds of work and mass urban migration were turning a nation of hardy farm workers into one of sedentary city folk. The situation was regarded as nothing less than a national security risk. A physically weak nation supplied its military with weak soldiers. These anxieties have long influenced American ideas about fitness and cemented the link between military exercise practices and civilian exercise trends. So it was that the sit-up, which has been around in one form or another since antiquity, did not fully conquer America until the early 1940s, when the United States Army enshrined it in cadets' physical training and testing. In later years, the U.S. Navy and Marines endorsed the crunch. Whichever variation was in play, military personnel had to complete as many as possible in two minutes, double the time that would later be assigned to grade schoolers, but otherwise the same test, end quote. But why did the military think the sit-up was so great? Why had so many people for so long thought that this was the best way to build strength? Because, for most of history, scientists studying the human body, especially the inside bits like muscles and bones, were studying cadavers. And not just that, but they would study each part separately, literally separating tissues from muscles and laying them flat on a table. From this technique, they ascertained, according to Pete McCall, a fitness educator who spoke with The Atlantic, that it must be your abdominal muscles that pull your spine around. And if you want to become and stay strong, you need to pull your spine around a lot. This paradigm didn't change until researchers started studying subjects with every part of the body still connected, upright instead of laid flat, and also, you know, alive. As McCall put it, quote, If you want to understand how muscles function, you need to understand what they do while the body is on two feet moving through gravity. End quote. And continuing from the Atlantic, quote, Now we know that muscles don't function alone. Abs are the most visible muscles in a ripped midsection, but they work in concert with a slew of others, including the diaphragm, obliques, erector spinae, and the muscles of the pelvic floor, in order to make all of the tiny movements that most people really only notice after they've slept funny. When people talk about the core, which has largely replaced abs in fitness jargon, they mean all of these muscles as they work together. End quote. McCall says that a lot of the credit for uncovering the harms of the sit-up and popularizing replacements for it goes to Canadian biomechanics researcher Stuart McGill. His research on the spine in the 90s and 2000s led him to the discovery that sit-ups and crunches weren't just weak sauce exercises for building strength, but actively hurting people. McGill told The Atlantic, quote, If you bend the spine forward over and over again when not under load, not much happens to the spine. 
The problem occurs when you flex over and over again with load from higher muscle activation or external objects held in the hands. End quote. As The Atlantic explains further, quote, If you've ever been told to lift with your legs, this is why. When a person's spine curves and strains in order to move weight through space, like when a bunch of third graders flail through a set of sit-ups, the movement stresses their spinal discs. The more often you ask your spine to flex in those circumstances, the riskier it is. McGill found that the most reliable way to avoid this kind of chronic problem is to brace your core when you pick up something heavy. That means tensing key muscles in order to protect your spine's structural integrity and to help shift the effort to your hips and legs. The sit-up and crunch violate all of these principles. The exercise asks you to pick up something heavy, but because you're lying on the ground and the heavy thing is your upper body, there's no way for you to brace your core and shift the effort to the big, high-capacity muscles of your legs. And the exercise is, by its nature, repetitive. For generations, school children and troops were told to do as many sit-ups or crunches as possible in order to score well on compulsory testing." End quote. And yes, a lot of people can do sit-ups and crunches without issue and do very many of them very well, but McGill explained that it's largely dependent on genetic factors, not necessarily on executional skill. So, especially for an exercise used to test skill, strength, and commitment across a broad range of body types, it really doesn't work. McGill and others have been publishing research on their findings for years, and as I shared at the top with the military and the Presidential Youth Fitness Program dropping sit-up requirements, the concept is is spreading. But if you're like me, this whole idea might have taken you by surprise. You know, I grew up doing sit-ups and crunches in every kind of gym class, sports team, and other fitness activity I was involved in. I did a ton of them on my own, too, trying to get that elusive six-pack. At one point as a teenager, I could do hundreds of them in one sitting. Killed my back, but I thought it just meant that I needed to keep doing more. In fact, I've had fitness instructors tell me that as an adult. And maybe I just misunderstood them, but McCall says despite how basically no qualified educators would recommend sit-ups anymore, it takes a long time for that knowledge to trickle down to independent trainers. There aren't across-the-board licensing or continuing education requirements for teaching most forms of exercise, so there's no central place where new findings and guidelines would be distributed. Plus, trying to convince people, whether it's the instructors themselves or their clients, that the sit-up and the crunch aren't actually effective is a huge uphill battle. It's ingrained in so many of our minds as, well, the backbone of our workouts. As The Atlantic points out, ab workouts are particularly popular, or nefarious depending on your view, among bodybuilders, subscribing to the myth that you can target just one specific muscle for spot training, as well as among the endless flood of ads claiming a 10-second workout will give us the beach-ready body of our dreams. Quote, the spammy false promise of one weird trick to reduce belly fat lives on in the dregs of internet advertising to this day precisely because people click on it. End quote. But if the sit up is no longer recommended by the experts, what should we be doing instead? McGill recommends planks bird dogs, and those curl-ups, all exercises that work our whole bodies in concert with one another, strengthening the core, but not sacrificing our backs in the process. I talk a lot about growing plants, especially edible ones, in space. One, because plants and space are two of my favorite things, so I will always think it's cool. And two, because as we get closer and closer to the Artemis mission, returning humans to the moon, and edge towards longer and longer term journeys in space, being able to grow food on board or on other surfaces like the moon or Mars will be incredibly important. And there was a huge milestone in this work that I mentioned last month when scientists successfully grew plants in actual moon dust for the first time. But that huge achievement was possible thanks to at least two key things. One, astronauts in the 70s bringing back the lunar regolith samples that have been saved all this time, and two, the over a hundred years worth of research that had been done on growing plants in extreme conditions that don't usually support life. Now, I'm not saying that we've been studying growing plants in lunar regolith for over a hundred years, or that that was even a thought in people's heads at the turn of the 20th century, but what was on their mind was growing plants in Antarctica. 
Daniel McCahey is a historian of Antarctic science at Texas Tech University, one of those jobs that kind of makes you think, why didn't anyone tell me that was an option when I was a kid? And she recently shared a brief overview in the conversation about the history of growing plants in Antarctica and when scientists started gearing those experiments specifically towards research for future space missions. According to McCahey, the very first plants intentionally grown in Antarctic soils were in 1902 by British physician and botanist Reginald Kotelitz. Taking soil from the region he and his team were docked at, he brought it back aboard the expedition ship and successfully used the soil to grow mustard and cress under a skylight on the ship. Now, not only did that 1902 experiment prove that growing plants in Antarctic soil was possible, but it ended up saving the day when there was an outbreak of scurvy among the crew and they were able to eat the leafy green plants to reduce their symptoms. But it turns out mustard and cress are about the extent of what can be successfully grown in Antarctic soil. And it's worth pointing out here that the plants recently grown in lunar regolith were also from the mustard family. It's a hardy plant in terms of growth and survival, but it doesn't produce the hardiest of meals for humans. And in subsequent years, scientists failed to grow any other non-native plants in Antarctic soil especially when they were planted directly in the ground as opposed to in a container like Kotelitz's mustard and cress that he grew on the ship. Now, notably, in 1904, Scottish botanist Robert Rudmose Brown picked out 22 seeds from cold-tolerant plants from the Arctic and sent them to Antarctica to see if they would grow. Unfortunately, they all failed to sprout, which was probably mostly due to the environmental conditions, but Rudmose Brown says it may also have been the absence of a botanist tending to them. Now, eventually, in the 1960s, scientists, many of whom were now living and working long-term at research stations in Antarctica, started growing crops using hydroponics. Hydroponics refers to growing plants in chemically enhanced water instead of soil. These scientists also set up their plants inside of greenhouses to shield them from the harsh environmental conditions. And, lo and behold, it started working. And while now there are plenty of greenhouses providing fresh food and much-needed psychological comfort to the researchers, technically it's all artificial conditions. The plants are not native to Antarctica, there's no Antarctic soil being used, and everything is being grown above ground in greenhouses. But what does all this have to do with space? Well, quoting Mikahi in the conversation, starting in the 1960s, scientists working for organizations like NASA began thinking of the hostile, extreme, and alien Antarctic as a convenient analog for space exploration, where nations could test space technologies and protocols, including plant production. And that interest continued through the end of the 20th century, but it wasn't until the 2000s that space became a primary goal of some Antarctic agricultural research. In 2004, the National Science Foundation and the University of Arizona's Controlled Environment Agriculture Center collaborated to build the South Pole Food Growth Chamber. The project was designed to test the idea of controlled environment agriculture, a means of maximizing plant growth while minimizing resource use. According to its architects, the facility closely mimicked the conditions of a moon base and provided an analog on Earth for some of the issues that will arise when food production is moved to space habitations. End quote. And such experiments and facilities continue in Antarctica to this day, even as the ISS runs its own experiments with growing food in space, something they've successfully done numerous times, much to the delight of the astronauts on board. Getting a bit of fresh lettuce or peppers is a huge boon when you've mostly had pre-packaged meals for weeks on end. And we still haven't quite hit the point of growing enough food in these harsh and closed environments to sustain a whole crew for an extended period. In 2018, Germany's Eden ISS program in Antarctica did manage to grow enough vegetables for one-third of the diet of a six-person crew. But in general, there is still work to be done, methods to be cracked. As Makahi put it, quote, Before sending people to the moon or Mars, it might be wise to first prove that a settlement can survive on its own amid the frozen southern plains of Earth. End quote. Did you know that mice are afraid of bananas? Or at least some male mice are. 
Researchers at McGill University noticed that male mice saw an increase in stress hormone levels and a reduction in their sensitivity to pain when they were around pregnant and lactating female mice. Co-author Sarah Rosen said that most likely occurred because the female mice were signaling to the potentially antagonistic males that they would defend their offspring vigorously. And all of this communicating, the threat of attack, the defensive response, and the stress from that response was all happening via smell. Smell is the main way that mice communicate with one another, and they've got some pretty sophisticated communication. So the researchers tested a bunch of different odorants to see which might be triggering the stress response in the males. One of the most effective at producing that response was N-pental acetate, a scent released in the urine of pregnant and lactating mice. But that's not the only place N-pental acetate shows up. It's also the compound responsible for creating that unique scent of bananas. So the researchers brought some banana oil back to the lab, and sure enough, the male mice exhibited the same stress response they did when they were near pregnant and lactating mice. Now, while there have been a number of studies in rodents showing examples of male-to-female olfactory-based social signaling, there haven't been that many of female-to-male, especially non-sexually. So the study stands out for that reason, but also, says psychology professor Jeffrey Mogul, because it shows yet another instance in which a, quote, previously unknown factor in the lab environment can affect the results of scientific studies. End quote. And yeah, I mean, imagine you're studying these male mice for some random experiment and you notice that increased stress response, thinking it's a result of whatever your experiment is. But really, it's because you've put them in a cage near some pregnant mice or just left your bananas from lunch sitting on a nearby table. So many tiny, tiny things can affect any study. Things you might not even think to consider. It's kind of wild we figure out anything at all when you think about it. Well, that's it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.